video tutorial, we will be looking at the government. Well, before we start, we, I need to define the government. And the government is referred to that group of people who is in charge of the country's affairs and are given the responsibility to govern the country. And there are three branches of the government. The legislative branch or the lawmaking side. We have the judicial branch which involves the courts and we have the executive branch which consists of cabinet. Now throughout this entire lecture we're going to it's going to be a lot. We're going to look at the functions of the government, the different the arms of the government or the branches of the government. We are going to look at how a law is made from a bill. How a law is passed, sorry, so from a bill to actual law that we must abide to. We're going to look at um, under the judicial branch, I'm going to take you through the different types of court systems we have in the Caribbean and we're going to focus on Trinidad and Tobago. Remember when you're writing the exam for social studies, we have to focus on a Caribbean country and it's always good to focus on the country you are accustomed to. Then we have the functions of the government. We have who are the prime minister and the role of the prime minister. We have the prime ministers of Trinidad and Tobago in terms of the first prime minister and the present prime minister and a lot of you don't know these things i have the roles of the president okay the roles of the president is an enormous people say that the president don't do anything we have a long list of roles of the president then we have the different presidents of Trinidad and tobago from the first president to the present president we also have the different types of government systems we'll be looking at. We'll be looking at Crown Colony, what is constitutional government, and what is a monarchy. Okay? And just to end it off, we're going to look at governance. What is good governance and the characteristics of it. So stay, stay tuned. We have a full lesson ahead of us. If you look on your screen, you're going to see an organizational type diagram which breaks down the government and all its components for us. At the very top, we have the president. And the president is in command. He is the head of the state and command of the legislative branch, as you can see on your screen, the executive branch, and the judiciary. Under the legislative branch, we have what is called parliament. And under parliament, we have the senate. And the House of Representatives. It's shown on the diagram right here. Just flow down, okay? We have the constitutional and other authorities falling underneath the jurisdiction of the president. We have the Ombudsman. We have the Auditor General. We have the Ele Elections and Boundaries Commission. We have the Judicial and Legal Service Commission. We have Registration, Recognition and Certificate Board. We have the Police Service Commission. The Statutory Authority, Service Commission, Integrity Commission, Industrial Court, Salaries Review Commission, Tax Appeal Board, and the Law Commission. Under the Executive Branch, we have the Prime Minister and Cabinet. So the Prime Minister and all the ministers that fill the Cabinet in the um, Parliament. And it's also good to note that the Parliament also consists of the Opposition, which was the losing party. Then we have Ministries of statutory boards and similar bodies such as the Ministry of Education, Ministry of Health, Ministry of Tourism, Ministry of Sports, etc. Underneath the Judicial Branch or the Judiciary, we have the Supreme Court and the Magistrate Court. Underneath the Supreme Court, we have the High Court and the Court of Appeal. So these things will be dealt with in depth, but this is just like a breakdown to show you how the government is outlined starting from the very top who is the president and then the different branches note that the prime minister falls under the executive branch move on to the executive branch now we're going to branch out the government now so we're dealing with the executive branch or cabinet and this comprise of the prime minister the attorney general and the ministers of the different counties each of these ministers has a portfolio which he or she is responsible Okay, so for example, in the area that I live is the San Juan San Joseph area, and the minister in charge of here under the PNM is uh, Mr. Terence Dialsing. Okay, he is also minister of health. 
So besides being a minister for a constituency, he also holds a separate portfolio. And then we have your example here on the slide where the Minister of Education is in charge of the affairs of the country regarding education, whereas the Minister of Tourism is responsible for managing all issues that are related to tourism. So even though there are ministers for in certain ministries, there are also candidates that went up for election and may have possibly won and have to serve the constituents that they fall under. Okay, so that's the executive branch or the cabinet. Now to the legislative branch, also known as parliament or the lawmaking aspect of the government. Basically, the legislative branch, as I reiterate, is the lawmaking body in the country. This arm of government is comprised of the bicameral system or two houses of parliament. Now, the bicameral system of gov um, in the government basically says that we have two houses of parliament. Okay, by two. So we have the upper house or the senate as we would call it and the lower house or the house of representatives. These two houses serve different roles and functions and um, they all fall under the legislative branch. So when we talk about like a law getting enforced in society it have to pass through the legislative branch of parliament. It must go by decision and rigidity. It is rigid in Trinidad and Tobago to change a law because we have what is known as a written constitution and a written constitution is very hard to change as well as an unwritten constitution. You have on your screen how law, a law is passed, okay? So the law starts off with a bill and once the bill is passed it becomes a law. And the stages of a bill within each house there are steps or stages through which a bill must pass. These are first reading, then a second reading, and a committee of the whole report from committee of the whole as a, and a third reading, okay? So it goes through three readings basically for each person or bodies to scrutinize the law and ensure that it makes sense. Okay, so the first, I have a flow diagram to the right if you notice it. We'll go through that now. And the first step in passing a law is the bill is discussed in the lower house of after the steps above it is then passed on to the upper house okay so after the bill is discussed in the lower house it is passed on to the upper house when the bill is passed now to the upper house there if there are any changes it is sent back to the lower house so if there are any discrepancies in what was sent down sent up sorry by the lower house they send it back down to the lower house for them to change and then it is sent back to the lower house and it needs to be approved once more so this is what takes time if i pass a bill i'm going to have so many people scrutinizing it in the lower house when i reach in the upper house it's like a different set of people just waiting to attack it and then they move back down that's why some laws take years to pass Okay, the third step now, the bill then goes to the president to be assented or agreed upon or dissented or disagreed. So here we have people say we don't know what the president does or what is the role of the president. But the president actually have a heavy plate. Okay, after it is approved by the upper house, it moves to the president who will further give an approval. The president here also have the opportunity to disagree okay and once the president asserts or assert in terms of agree the bill finally becomes a law and then it is announced in parliament so the first part it must be discussed in the lower house once all approvals are made it moves up to the upper house and if any changes it moves back to the lower house but after it finishes in the upper house, it goes to the president who either assent or dissent, who either agree or disagree on it. And once the president agrees, the law is passed. Now, it's just four steps here, but this, these four steps can take up to 20 years. They are law since 1983 that are still waiting to pass in Trinidad and Tobago, right? And the, as governments go by, in the different terms, they try to pass as much as they can. So, for instance, for this new coronavirus pandemic, they, they quickly did 
pass some laws and put it in place in terms of writing and they posted it in terms of the offenses if caught without a mass if caught congregating etc so they can't move fast with um applying laws but it always takes time you see when we have a bill sometimes we need to we need to ensure first that the bill we have do not mesh with what is already written in the constitution so the bill cannot say i give um everyone the authority to have our own one air rifle or one gun right but whereas in the lower part of the constitution we have a firearms usage um part that says not everybody is allowed to have a, a firearm they must own a fireman's license so if i should send up the first part that i speak of where everybody should have a gun then i will be um, contradicting what is later said in the Constitution so this is why we need to read and discuss it needs to go to the lower to the upper and president before okay and it's all in the benefit of society we move on to the judicial branch of the government we, all, we also call this branch the judiciary and it consists of the courts and this branch of the government is there to maintain the law okay and the order of the country and the chief justice is in charge of the judiciary okay so when we say maintain the law so if i pass a law stating um and nobody must be outside after six no congregation and if we see you congregating in public with a group of people at this time we could charge you fifty thousand dollars the judiciary is responsible for that and here's where the police work hand in hand so let's say you were caught doing drugs right and illegal drugs let's say like cooking so the police caught you doing that they have all rights to arrest you and take you down and then you'll have to wait for your court which who will be the judicial branch coming into play to determine what your punishment will be now once a law is enforced it is important to know that once broken um punishment will be served in this video in this part of the video now we will look at the different courts that are underneath the judicial branch and the first court that we will look at is the privy council which is the highest court of the british caribbean used in the final court of appeal it used to be in england because it was felt that a foreign body will be more impartial and fair so when we deal with our murder cases it usually takes years and people want to know why it takes so long for some justice to happen but once it reaches Privy Council, it is out of our jurisdiction. Now, there is a Privy Council in the Caribbean, and all our matters must go to there for them to sometimes have a decision for once and for all. And this used to be in England. For, for a different eye to look at the matter, just like our jury would look at the matter in court. But the Privy Council usually have the right sometimes to make the final appeal. Then we look at the Caribbean Court of Justice or the CCJ as we would hear it in the news and this is now the highest court of many Caribbean countries. If someone is unhappy with one of the rulings made they can go for the CCJ for a final appeal. So they serve the same purpose of the Privy Council but they are based in the Caribbean. So the CCJ basically replaced the Privy Council in the Caribbean and, and if one way or the other you have a matter that you're not pleased about in terms of the decision made you have the the authority to go to the Caribbean Court of Justice and re-amend that appeal okay the next court as you can see on your screen is family court and these deal with matters concerning family so child custody divorce um, alimony maintenance um, Milan and dispute settlement between among siblings all those things will fall under family court um, we go on now to the remainder we have three more that falls underneath the branch of the judiciary other courts that fall underneath the judiciary is the magistrate court and this is a low is the lowest court in the land let's say somebody got caught stealing from a grocery store the matter tend to go to the magistrate court and if the more serious it moves to the high court um they deal with the first offenses or summary of criminal matters 
They facilitate preliminary cases and serious offenses as such indictable offenses and cases that warrant a trial by the jury. So the magistrate court deals with petty issues, they would call it. But once it gets serious and it turns out to be something more, it must be moved to high court. Okay? Um, if you need simple things like a restraining order, you need to go to the magistrate courts for that. The, um, the person, there are people there that will sign off on it and you would have to attend court as usual. But the magistrates, they have... A different approach to the aspects of law as it will be in high court okay and now we move on to high court and high court is the next level of courts in Trinidad and Tobago and this court is responsible for indictable criminal matters family matters and criminal um, civil matters the court have a jury of your peers or fellow men who will decide the fate of the defendant on hearing both sides of the case with the evidence presented to them now when sometimes when we apply for family issues sometimes it, they deem it very much um an issue to be of high court and once it's high court you have to be represented by an attorney and you have you cannot speak in court it takes a whole different approach if it's not high court you can go and speak for yourself okay so high court always you need the defendant and the respondent always need the backup of attorney. It's that level where you have to throw regards and respects at all levels. And then the final court underneath the judiciary is the Court of Appeal or Supreme Court. And if a person does not agree with the ruling made by jurors, then they could go to the Court of Appeal or Supreme Court where, where a tribunal of judges will review the case and make a judgment. Now, sometimes you wouldn't be happy with the results from the magistrate court or family court or privy council. So you decide that I want to go to the court of appeal and change this. But sometimes in the previous ruling, you have the best option and you go in the court of appeal or the Supreme Court now and try to change it and end up having less than what you get. So these things work both ways. Okay, so those were the six types of courts that are found underneath the branches of the judiciary. So we have, so far in this lesson, we have looked at the definition of a government and I will reiterate to be the group of people that is in charge of the country's affairs and we looked at the different branches of the government. We have the legislative branch, executive branch and the judiciary. Now we will quickly touch on the functions of the government and as I read them, it's on your screen, I will explain it to you. So it's, it's very good that you could pause and make notes if you have to, jot notes if you need to. Okay, so the first function, I will start from the top arrow, is to maintain law and order. We talked about this, they make the law, they ensure that the law is enforced and abide to. Okay, and by making law, they try to keep order in society. Because if we had no laws, everybody would be running around doing what they want and it wouldn't make sense. So the government have law in place for order in society. Okay, the second function of the government is to raise taxes. Now, remember, most of the money that the government has to spend, if not 90% of that money, comes from taxes. So everything you buy will pay tax. It have tax on um, customs and duties. It have tax on regular food items. All this money adds to the government and that is where they get their source of income for the budget, the yearly budget. Okay? The next function of the government is to provide public goods. When we say public goods, we mean goods that we cannot buy in a store. It means goods like water, electricity and um, along the service commission goods we need to also know that public goods will always be governed by the government will be in the hands of a private authority the next function of the government is to minimize inequality now this is a very difficult thing to do inequality means every if you look at our um, national anthem, every creed and race finds an equal place. So we shouldn't have cases of discrimination. We shouldn't have 
a, a fight between East Indians and, and Africans for a job. Everything should be equal. We should also have equality in society. But remember, we live in society where we would have rich people in terms of the, the as they would call it, them the bourgeois, but those people are not really, we don't use that term anymore, but um, we have the middle class people, which is the working class, and then we have people under poverty. So the government now needs to try to get these people to an acceptable standard of living, and they call that equality. So those in poverty and don't have a house to live, they usually get those government assisted houses. Um, um, the, the, but there's this thing now when you work, the more money you make, the more tax you have to pay. So to minimize inequality, the government mainly look at the lower levels of the government, um, sorry, the, of society and try to ensure that they have what they need in order to survive. So food, um, a shelter, clean water, electricity, and access to education. The government is also responsible to reducing market failures. Now, people investing in the market can lead to a lot of loss, millions and millions of dollars that are uh, lost every year because of market failure. So the government should be the body to regulate that for investors. The government also is responsible for macroeconomic stability. Macroeconomic mean um, everything else, not people's personal income, but everything outside of that. So people access to jobs, um, the government's money, and the economy, to so to speak. Right? The function of the government is also national defense. The government is in charge of all the defense force, the fire, service, police service, um, air guard, coast guard, etc. And the last function we will look, sorry, the second, the last function we will look at is to regulate labor markets. So when we say to regulate labor markets, it means to make sure that there are jobs always available for the citizens, okay? And then the last function of the government is protection of the environment. And this is achieved again through laws. So we have laws for littering, laws for um, endangering rare species of animals, law for recycling, we have law for hunting, like there's a, there's a ban now where we have hunting season and once that's closed you're not allowed to do so. So the um, function of the government to protect the environment is done through laws and these laws are usually enforce just like any other law but there are different bodies in charge of it such as um organizations such as the eme for instance okay so those are the functions of the government again you can pause the video and make notes under each one i would encourage you to do so and this is important this can come in your paper two in section two and three so i would encourage you to really purport some effort into understanding this move on to who is the prime minister and the prime minister is that person who is elected as the head of a political party and once that party wins the election that person who is head of that political party is usually the prime minister okay so you can read with me on your slide where there's an occasion for the appointment of a prime minister in the section 76 um, chapter 1 of the Constitution such as after general election the president must appoint a prime minister or a member of the House of Representatives who is a leader in the House of Party which commands to support the majority of members of that house okay under the party system operates in Toronto Tobago that person is usually the party's leader so, for instance, we have two parties in Trinidad. We have, well, we have more than two, but the two main parties then is UNC and PNM. The head of UNC is um, Kamala Prasad Bissessa, and the head of the PNM is Dr. Keith Rowley. Now, if UNC should have won the, the 2015 general election, then Kamala would have been the Prime Minister. Unfortunately, they lost, and PNM 
took control and hence the head of the PNM party who is Dr. Keith Rowley became Prime Minister. So all these things you're supposed to know based on keeping up with social events. Okay? Where no majority party emerges or where the party has no undisputed leader, the president appoints as Prime Minister the person who is in his view most likely to do so. So if the party didn't elect somebody to be Prime Minister, um, or they don't have a leader in the party, and that particular party wins election, the, the president have the authority to appoint somebody. Okay? And in this case, the president uses his own discretion. The person appointed must be willing to accept the office of the prime minister. The prime minister's position of authority derives from the majority of support in the House of Representatives and from the power to appoint and dismiss ministers. The minister, the Prime Minister presides over cabinet and is responsible for the allocation and functions among ministries. So the Prime Minister now is responsible for who is allocated in what ministry. So he will appoint who is the Minister of Health, who is the Minister of Education, Minister of Communications, etc. Okay, the Prime Minister has also has effective control of the national affairs and the Prime Minister keeps the President fully informed according um, to issues concerning the general conduct of the government and shall finish the, furnish the President with such information that he may request with respect to any particular matter relating to the government. So everything the Prime Minister do, he must report to the President. Okay, and the office of the Prime Minister is also responsible for constitutional matters, national statistics, public holidays, national awards, and library services. So, the Prime Minister and his office have their own rules and functions that we need to look at. I would encourage you here to pause and take down this entire note that you see on your screen. It will be helpful. Now we have a table explanation of the different Prime Ministers of Trinidad and Tobago starting from the very first President when we became independent to the present um, Prime Minister as of today, okay? So we'll start from the top. The first Prime Minister of Trinidad and Tobago since we became an independent country is Dr. Eric Williams and he served from 1961 to 1981. Then after Dr. Williams, we have Mr. George Chambers, and he served from 1981 to 1986. After George Chambers, we have Mr. Arthur Napoleon Raymond Robinson, and these people you should learn from primary school social studies, and he took office from 1986 to 1991. After Mr. Robinson, we had Mr. Patrick Manning, and he served... A number of periods from 91 to 95, 2001 to 2002, 2002 to 7, and 7 to 10. Now, 7 to 10, it was when he confessed and gave up his prime ministerial post and they called for election. And here is where Miss Kamala Prasad Vicesa took office, okay? But before she took office, we also had Mr. Basdeo Pandey from 1995 to 2000 and 2001. For a year. After we have Miss Kamala Prasad Bissessa from 2010 to 2015, and from 2015 onwards, we have Dr. Keith Rowley. So these are important facts that you should know about your country. Again, write it down and learn them. It is important. Now we will look at the role of the president, and the president is a person that is head of state, right? So the first role of the president is to be the head of state, as you can see on your screen. The second role of the government um, president in the government system then is commander in chief of armed forces, the board, the T TNT defense force, the regiment, the coast guard, air guard, and defense force reserves. Commander in chief meaning all decisions must pass through the president. Okay. The president also have executive authority of Trinidad Tobago, and this is vested upon them. So executive authority, remember the executive we talk about is where we have the cabinet, where we have parliament. So the president is a kind of overarching person in that manner. We now have 
The fourth rule, which is custodian of all state lands, landless leases after consultation with the Office of the Solicitor General. So, anything to do with state land must pass through the government. And state land meaning th that those land that are not owned by private individuals, okay? Then we have the role to appoint a prime minister. So, you remember just now I was talking about the... Any in the event that we don't elect a person in a party to be prime minister, the president have the ruling to do so. And the president also have the authority to appoint a leader of opposition. Okay, the, for, the president must make the following appoint, appointment act in accordance with the advice of the prime minister. The role of a president is also to overact the attorney general the ministers the parliamentary secretariats and appointment of senators in accordance with the advice of prime minister the leader of operation on his own discretion so we'll continue along now we have the other set of the roles of the government i mean it's a lot so we have to go through as much as we can you need to learn a few of but you need to write them down as well the first, in this slide, the first role of the president is to assent to bills, meaning to agree to bills so that they could become law. Remember, we talk about the lawmaking process. After the bill moves from the upper house, it moves to the president for an assent or a dissent in terms of him agreeing or disagreeing in order for it to become an act which is enforceable. Okay? So, the role of the president can also be to proclaim certain pieces of legislation, the power of pardon, stay of ex execu execution, reduced form of punishment, remittance, a full part of sentence. So long ago, in terms of pardon, the Queen has this authority. The Queen still has this authority, okay? The President can be the one to pardon a criminal. Let's say I was sentenced to hang. The President can pardon my punishment and I can be free. The President can also proclaim a state of emergency. So let's say we have, uh, let's say the coronavirus had a, a, a phase, a second outbreak in Trinidad and Tobago and it's really out of hand. The president can oversee and um, call for a state of emergency. Let's say crime escalates and it's well to control. The president can call a state of emergency. In terms of countries that have warfare etc the president has the final say the president also have the function of hosting national awards annually as chancellor of the order recommendation made by the prime minister national awards committee chaired by the chief justice so when we have our national awards you know like the shakonia medal etc this is hosted by the president the president has a role to also issue and make orders and receive ambassador or high commissioner delegates of president of credentials. So we move along. Now we have more roles of the president and as you can see on your screen, the, the next set of roles of the president involves the appointment of a high commissioner or ambassador in accordance with the advice of the prime minister. Credentials are signed to go to the corresponding head of state right we have dissolved parliament in accordance with the advice of the prime minister so sometimes something in parliament needs to be dissolved and if the prime minister deemed it necessary the president could oversight it and ensure that it is dissolved again any appointment to the commission of inquiry is in accordance with the prime minister who has to be guided by the president and then we have the one of the role of the president is to account for the reporting by the prime minister so if i am prime minister of a country i have to report everything to the to the president who would give me consultation feedback and advice the president is to be kept abreast by the chief of defense staff as commander in chief so remember we talk about them the president being that oversight and body in the defense force they have to ensure that all decisions make their uh, good ones okay 
and they're also patron to many organizations such as Chief Stouts. Final roles of the president. And basically, in the absence of president or if the office of president is vacant, the president senate acts temporarily as a president. So once the president is not there, the president senate takes place. Where the president of senate is unable to act, the speaker of the house acts as president. Okay, so you will see if you watch the parliament channel, sometimes you watch the speaker and they knock in and you say, oh gosh, that person really has much to do. That person is very important. That person is to a line if the president is unavailable. Makes the following appointment after consultation with the Prime Minister and Leader of the op Opposition. So, again, once everything is, a, is agreed and according to, the President will make the final decision and appointment of the following bodies that I've listed on, on there. So, we started with Chief Justice, the Ombudsman, Member of Elections, Boundaries Commission, Member of Environmental Commission, Auditor General, Member of Integrity Commission, Member of the Judicial and Legal Services, Members of the Law Reform Commission, Members of the Police Service Commission, Members of the Public Service Commission, Members of the Salary Reviews Commission, Members of the Teaching Service Commission, Equal Opportunity Commission, Public Service Appeal Board, Law Reform Commission, Environment Commission, Police Service Commission, etc. Right, so we have a whole host to deal with here. So once um, the, the okay is given by the Prime Minister, the President has the authority to make an appointment. Now we will look at the different presidents in Trinidad and Tobago from the first president, move on to the present. On to the different presidency or Presidents that we have from since day one in Trinidad and Tobago, since we became independent. And our first president was Sir Ellis Clark. Then we had Noor Hassan Ali, A.N.R. Robinson, George Maxwell Richards, Anthony Carmona, and after Anthony Carmona, we have Miss Paula May Weeks. Now, note that Miss Paula May Weeks is the first woman prime minister in Trinidad and Tobago so when we look at that section of social studies dealing with gender equality and roles we can always use her as an example okay these things that I'm these facts that I'm putting here for you might not be straightforward in a question but it could be pertinent to a country and you could use them wisely in a case study or your example so it's always good to learn these things now we move on to the different types of government systems and three systems will be under review for this subject and it is the first on your screen you'll see crown colony then we have constitution and monarchy so stay tuned on your screen you will see the notes for what is a crown colony and a crown colony is a british overseas territory under the direct authority of the british crown as such, a crown colony does not possess its own representative government and it is not represented by the British Parliament. The colony is administered by a governor appointed by the crown and responsible for, to the colonial office or its forerunners. So back in our slavery days, we could say we had a crown colony government where we had... Um, we were like the different Caribbean islands were colonial under colonialism okay where it was governed by somebody head who would be back then would be the the queen or the british government back then okay so the governor has a wide range of authority and is assisted either by an appointed advisory council or by both a legislative and executive council. So even though the governor is part of the authority, authority of the Crown Colony government system, they need to follow guidelines from the leg legislative and executive councils. Okay? And only at a later stage did the Crown Colony government and some colonies rely on elected councils. So this is like a rule out system of government, but we still need to know about it because our history builds on it. The system of government we will look at is the constitu constitutional government. And this is defined by the existence of a constitution. Now most countries are governed by a constitution, whether it is a written or unwritten one. Okay, we rely on written one 
with enshrined rules and legislative to govern the country and unwritten ones are ones that could be easily changed. The Constitution is a legal instrument or merely a set of fixed norm and principles that are generally accepted as fundamental laws. Okay, when we say we have a written constitution, it means that it is enshrined in a document that is very hard to change. And when we have to change a law based on a written constitution, we must go through the lower house, the upper house, and the president. In an unwritten constitution, like what the United States have, the um, any form of law changing or lawmaking can be done in the different houses. They don't have a parliament like us, but they have their own authoritative author um, branches of the government to deal with it. If we had an unwritten constitution, parliament could have made changes so easy that, you know, bills and laws wouldn't take so much time to become enforced. So constitutional government deals with gov a government that is run by a constitution. When we talk about the constitutional government, we talk about two terms that will, al will always come up to play, okay? And the first term is constitutional supremacy, and you will see these on your screen. This refers to the system of government in which the lawmaking freedom of parliamentary supremacy cedes to the requirements of a constitution. So constitutional supremacy means the constitution is the highest form of order in a country, and everything that the government do must coincide with what is in the constitution. Okay, and then we have what is called parliamentary supremacy. And this is a preemptory rule of constitutional law that legislative assembly can make or repeal laws at their own will. So countries that have um, an unwritten constitution then, we would say a parliamentary supreme so that they at any time can make and change laws in parliament. Okay, so these are two terms that we need to know as well form of government that we will look at is the monarchy and the, in this form of government a person or the monarch is head of state for life or, or until abdication and abdication is the act of formally relinquishing a head of state when we look at think about the monarchy you could see on your screen a picture of the queen she is one of the head of state that could govern uh, many decisions based on different countries Okay, and if we had a monarchy system of government, the queen would have been the head of state. One of the objectives that we must look at too in social studies when we talk about the government is good governance. Okay, and we need to define what is good governance and the functions of good governance. Okay, or the characteristics of good governance. When we talk about good governance, we talk about that means that of processing that institution produce results that meet the needs of society while making the best use of the resources at hand. Basically, in good governance, everything should be accounted for. There should be transparency and accountability for everything. And the use of the country resources should be done in a logical manner, not to waste. So based on good governance, our resources are used and, um, at the maximum potential while not wasting or keeping it for sustainable development. In terms of good governance, we have many characteristics of it. So the first characteristics, as you can see on your screen, is participation. So basically, even as a country, all men and women should have a voice, should be able to say and purport their needs and wants and directly affect the decision making process okay the second characteristic a characteristic as you can see on your screen is equity and this is where all men and women have the opportunities to improve or maintain their well-being so basically equality and equity goes hand in hand the next characteristics of good governance we look at is the rule of law and these are legal frameworks that should be fair and enforcing partially particular um, particularly the law on human rights. So one of the major rule underneath the rule of law is that no man is above the law, okay? Meaning you cannot go against the law. 
The next characteristic is consensus orientation and under good governance mediates different interests to reach a board of consensus on which is the, in the best interest of the group and where possible policies and procedures happen. Okay, so that is consensus orientation. So based on what, based on what the government sees as the forefront, they can make possible policies and procedures to make sure that is in place. The next characteristics of good governance that we will look at is transparency. And transparency is built on the free flow of information, processes, and institutions. Okay? Information are directly accessible to those concerned with them. So the government now are disseminating grants with everybody in society. The government now must be accountable and be transparent in the distribution of this. This money that was drawn from the Heritage and Stabilization Funds, many people in the public and the opposition are calling for a review of where that money went in terms of transparency. When we have transparency, we have low chances of laundering or any forms of theft and controversies that could arrive otherwise, right? The other characteristics of good governance is responsiveness. Institutions and processes try to serve all stakeholders, so they are responsive to everybody who are a part of them. Okay, so now we'll continue with the various characteristics of good governance. Characteristics of good governance that we will look at is effectiveness and efficiency. And processes and institutions produce results that meet needs while making the best use of resources. So our government must be effective and efficient. With resources okay so they drain the heritage and stabilization fund and people are still not getting assistance in this time so people are asking why some people are contesting that the government is not efficient with what they are doing okay the government um, good governance also acts on the characteristic of accountability as you can see on the screen decision maker in government the private sector and civil society organization are accountable to the public as well as institutional stakeholders. This accountability depends is dependent on the organizations and whether the decisions is internal or external in the environment. So whatever decision they make, they must be accountable for it. Everything that the government do, they must be accountable for it. Okay, and then the last characteristics of good governance is strategic decisions. And a leader and the public have a broad, long-term perspective on good governance and human development, along with a sense of what is needed for such development. There is also an understanding of historical, cultural, and social complexities in which that perspective is grounded. So strategic decision-making means you align what you do with the mission and the goals of what you are set out to do. You think strategically. You don't just make decisions. Whatever you promise to do as a government, you need to go and find ways and means of doing so and make decisions to suit and ensure that resources are evenly distributed. So this takes us to the end of this lesson. I know it was a long one and it have a lot of information that I would encourage you to pause and take notes for. Um, next tutorial we will be looking at the voting procedure in Trinidad and Tobago and Guyana in terms of first past the post and proportional representation. When we're done with that we will look at how elections are done in terms of campaigning etc and take the other form of the government okay underneath the government. After these two lessons we should more or less finish the syllabus requirements for government so we can start to do past papers. So for now I would encourage you to pause the video and make notes and understand the material that I'm giving you for the next two weeks because from the third week we are going to look at past papers for this section and it is a lot. So again I hope you pause the video, make notes, any questions and queries you can message me and anything that you need a clear up on you can also message me. But for now, try as much to read up on what was given. I have given you a list of questions to work on. Some of these information on this video would answer some of those questions. Again, correct them and take proper notes. So I hope you enjoyed this video. 
and until next lesson have a good one